Hello, everybody, and welcome to this uh, last uh, part of the webinar series in mastering the SQL Server migration. And this time we are talking about implementation, detail specification, and especially lessons learned. And um, well, let's go to the uh, next slide here. So first of all, we are going to go through panelists, then a little bit of panel discussion, Q&A for about 10 minutes, and then a summary. So that's in brief the agenda for today. And first of all, Matt. So uh, Matt is a Microsoft Data Platform MVP, developer slash DPA, director of database management at rev.io in Kentucky, USA. And he has worked with SQL Server since 2000, so over 20 years. And also he's the leader of the Lexington, Kentucky uh, Data Technology Group. And, and also Idra Ace alumnus and Fragment domestic speaker and the international community speaker. And 2021 friend of Red Gate. So welcome, Matt. Greetings. And the next, next guy, Rob Civil. And he's a Microsoft Cloud and Data Center MVP and Data Platform MVP, founder and developer and DBA in Civil's Consulting in the United Kingdom. And he's a, a Data Saturdays encourager and frequent domestic and international community speaker. Hello, Rob. Hello, everybody. And then Gianluca, Gianluca Sartori. He's a SQL Server MVP, founder and developer and DBA, located in Italy in a company called sqlconsulting.it. Works since SQL Server version 7 and frequent domestic and international community speaker. Hello, Gianluca. Hello, everyone. My name is Jani Savolainen, and I'm founder and CDO of SQL Governor and also DP Pro Services. And um, I'm a pretty much jack of all trades, king of none, developer slash data scientist most of the time. Located in Helsinki, Finland, and I have 21, 22 years experience in SQL Server technology from 6.5 and also former chairman of past Finland chapter. All righty. So um, what are we covering today? So we have gone through the business impact review, the selection of migration tools, uh, discussed about monitoring, technical planning, capacity planning and licensing review. And also uh, what else is around there before we are ready is the detailed specification and migration implementation. Today we are mostly talking about implementation and, 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 and uh, things around that, what we have uh, uh, found out when we have done those things. And, and that's pretty much what we are focusing. So um, first of all, let's go to the detailed specification. So, um, Rob, would you start from this topic? Of course. So, when we talk about detailed specification, and we've covered it a lot recently, you need to ask questions up front. And when you've finished asking questions, carry on asking questions. And when you think you have all of the information that you need, ask more questions. The more questions that you ask, the more information that you get back from your business early in this process, the less problems you will have as you go forward, the less things that are going to go wrong as you begin to do your migration. And we've talked a lot in previous webinars about the sort of questions that you need to ask. We're not just interested in what version of SQL are we running and how big is the data or how many instances do we have, or how many clusters or availability groups. You will need to know <clears throat> who accesses them, from which network they access them, 
what access controls they're going to need, which systems are going to access them, whether those systems are going to be able to access them. Don't forget, if you move your <coughs> instances into the cloud, then you might need to use a different driver for your connections. Does your old application understand that it can, that it can use that um, driver? You will continually need to keep going back and asking and verifying these questions. But the most important thing that you can do is to make sure that you gather as much information as you possibly can. <clears throat> now, I don't know whether you folk that are watching and listening are, are technical people or whether you're project management people or whether you're business owners. It doesn't matter. You know, all of you need to know that this particular part of your migration is absolutely vital. So all areas of the business need to be involved in making sure that this information is gathered into a place where people who are going to perform the technical migrations can take action on it. What you don't want to do is you don't want to end up with a situation where you have migrated 97% of everything and find out that the last 3% which is absolutely vital to your business and enables you to sell socks, cannot be migrated or cannot connect to that database. And then you have to try and roll stuff back and work things out. So detailed specification is not just about the technical drawing of the thing. It is about going and speaking to all of the people and all of the products and involved in what is going to be migrated yeah this well uh john luke come at do you want to add anything on that i think that was quite thorough but still uh if, if you have any any other uh opinions everything he said is right <laughs> <laughs> absolutely always a good answer yeah, exactly. That's that's exactly true. True what uh, Rob said, and that's also true that we refer to this detailed specification in in many areas of of the earlier webinars. So why don't you um, go to, uh, if you want to um, kind of uh, seek for uh, more information around this, and you haven't seen all the webinars, that would be a good idea to to go and check out. Okay, the next topic then. Um, implementation use cases and there are some use cases that we are going to go through one is migrating sql server 2019 on premises to manage instances matt is going to tell about that then it's, it's about the migrating instance on premises to on premises with dba tools rob is going to tell about that then we are going to go through the upgrading the SQL Server pre-2012 from on-premises to Azure with workload tools. jean -Luc is going to uh, tell about that. And then um, we are going to go, go through consolidating databases from different servers by harmonizing the workloads with SQL Governor. So these are the uh, topics. And I must say that on the last topic that I'm going to tell about, it's more about the uh, theory, how, how that really works, than actually showing any demonstration there with, with, with our software SQL coming. Okay, so first of all, this is the first thing here, and it's about migrating the SQL Server 2019 on-prem to manage instances. So, Matt, why don't you tell us something about that? Yeah, so I took this one uh, because it's something that I'm actually working on now. Um, so it's, it's very fresh. Um, so yeah, just just a few bullet points here. Arguably, this is maybe the easiest of, of the four, uh, but there are some things that may not go smoothly. So let's talk about those. <clears throat> um, some people think that because you're migrating from the latest version of the Box product to Azure, which should be a roughly equivalent um, that you don't need to do a lot of the things we've talked about in the previous parts of the series. Like it'll just work because it's new to new, right? That may not be true. Uh, it certainly could be, but it may not be because who knows, you know, you may be running 2019, but your compatibility level may be set at 120, something like that. Um, so definitely run the database migration assistant. That's what 
DMA stands for here. <clears throat> That's going to be valuable to you. Um, I can think of projects that I've worked on in, in the past where uh, uh, this same assumption was made. Like, well, it's 2019, it's all brand new, so we'll just migrate it and in Azure it'll work fine. And it didn't always. Um, so definitely run the migration assistant as we've gone over in, in the past. What, what that'll do is, is tell you if there are breaking changes that will happen as you upgrade, which seem unlikely in a scenario like this, but it will also tell you about things in your database in, in the code in there that are not supported any longer. So that's where the compatibility level thing could come through. Even though the version's 2019, if you're running you know, levels older, um, DMA is gonna call that out and say, you need to change this, otherwise when you migrate it, it could break, or it's not going to behave the, the way that you expect. Um, manage instance. So one thing I do wanna call out, and I feel like it, it kind of gets lost in, in the marketing of this a bit, is um, if you have an application, I can think of several that I've worked to migrate over the years, and including one right now, um, if it's wedded to a certain time zone, so, you know, it's easy for us all to say like, well, you should just use UTC for everything, right? And yeah, you probably should. But that's not reality, especially when you're dealing with older apps. You know, somebody wrote something years ago and they were sitting in a certain time zone and they wrote it, you know, wedded to that time zone. And maybe it's not a trivial effort to change that so it works anywhere else. Um, Azure SQL does not give you the ability to set the time zone, Manage Instance does. So when you create the instance, you can say, I am in Eastern time, I am in whatever, and uh, you can't change it after that. Uh, but it does give you the ability to migrate an application to a, and its database to a platform as a service offering, even when the time zone is very specific. And like I said, maybe we all agree it shouldn't be, but this is your option when, when you don't have that choice. Um, like I talked about in the first bullet point, compatibility level likely isn't significant here because generally by the time you've gone to a modern version like this, you've made the adjustments you needed to run on the modern version and use all the cool things that the modern version does. But it's not always the case. And to step outside of this use case for a bit, if you're, mi if, if you're migrating an older version, um, compatibility level could be very, very significant. Like if you're jumping over SQL 2014, the cardinality estimator changed then. The, you know, your entire workload could perform differently. So be, be mindful of that, whether you're on 2019, 2017 or whatever, compatibility level really is key. And if you've noticed, if you go to Microsoft sessions about this, they talk about SQL Server a lot more from a compatibility level perspective than a box product version, because that's kind of where they want this conversation to go, because it fits more hand in hand with Azure stuff, which let's be honest, is probably where they want us all to eventually end up one day. Um, so how do we get there? So we've talked about some stuff that might bite us. There's really two, I would say two main options or two kind of pieces of tooling that Microsoft provides to get you there. Um, Azure DMS is one of those. We referred to it briefly, I think, in the last webinar of this series. Um, what it is, is basically a service that you spin up in Azure. It's more or less a VM with some special stuff on it, uh, but that's kind of hidden from you. And it, it's fairly straightforward to walk through. You specify a source, you connect to that source, you specify the databases you want to move, you specify a target, you log into that, and then you talk, and then you specify the kind of migration you want to do. So you can migrate, you can do it offline or online. And um, I will say one thing where it's pretty good is it'll tell you the ground rules around all that. It'll tell you if your database is eligible for online or not. Um, you can migrate just the schema and then migrate the data later, which is typically the way that I do it. Um, and, and that would be that, that would be an offline migration. Um, so that's one way to do it. I've done it, works pretty well, uh, may not be the prettiest thing. Uh, it Performance is decent, but where even the online migration through DMS, in my opinion, is a little too slow. So where, where there was a gap, I would say until about February of this year, was if you were in an environment where downtime was 
critical. You know, let's say you walk in and say, okay, you want me to migrate application XYZ up to Azure. How much downtime can I take? And the business looks at you and says, a minute. That's difficult. <laughs> and there wasn't a great solution to that for, for a long time. There were there were ways to do it, but it was hard work and, and you really couldn't necessarily guarantee that time frame. Um, so what Microsoft did is create something called the log replay service, which is using log shipping to get things from on-prem to Azure MI. It gives you, so there's kind of an auto magic way to do it there and there's a more manual way to do it. But what it what it gives you is the ability to migrate stuff uh, when downtime, like I said, is, is a very important thing. We're talking just minutes or something like that. And so what you're doing is, is it's setting up log shipping behind the scenes and there's some nice GUI around this. So, you know, you're not having to script every last thing though, though you can. Um, and it, you're streaming that log traffic up to Azure and then in one of the modes can actually specify like I cut over now and it, resembles very much a log shipping failover because that's basically what it is. So obviously you'd have to take into account, we've talked about this, like migration isn't just the data people in your org. You need to have likely operations, networking, whatever it's called um, involved here. You know, they would need to make some changes to the application to talk to the MI versus the on-prem box. Um, but this does give you, you know, if, if, if you're just allowed minutes to make this cutover happen, uh, LRS is is the way to do that. And I'm very thankful to the folks that worked on this and wish it had been, uh, it had existed a couple of years ago because it would have made a couple of my projects a lot easier. Um, but that's kind of that, that's kind of the highlights of uh, really how you can do this. And honestly, how, how I intend to do this in the project that I'm on now. Okay, thanks Mike. Let's go forward. Okay, then, um... Uh, Rob is going to tell about herding cats. <laughs> well, about uh, <laughs> migrating all instance on premises to uh, on premises. Uh, sorry. Um, yeah, exactly. With DB tools. <laughs> sorry, my confusion here. <laughs> so yeah, I think uh, I think herding cats would have been an excellent uh, picture to add to my previous slide because. It certainly felt a bit like that. But this is not a cat that's under any trauma. This is a cat that is lying, sleeping peacefully. And for DBA tools, this is how we want our DBA to be, especially when performing migrations. DBA tools was built for migrations. That is the reason it came into existence six or so years ago now. And the aim is to make everything as simple and easy as possible. Now, I've not put a lot of words on here because you can very easily go and type into your favorite search engine, migrate instance with DBA tools, and you will find dozens of blog posts and videos and other information about it. What I'm gonna say is migrating an instance with DBA tools could be as simple as going copy dash DBA instance, source SQL instance, destination SQL instance, go. Now, you need a backup and restore flag in there as well, and a path to a place to put it. But eight words of a command, and it will do everything. It will copy all of the configuration on that source SQL instance, all of the databases, all of the logins, all of the jobs, all of the credentials, all of the, all of the, all of the, all of the and put them onto the destination instance. Great, amazing, it is fantastic, it is fabulous. I do not recommend that you do it, okay? Because I know you, and your databases are bigger than AdventureWorks. And we can do it with AdventureWorks really quickly, and it's not that big, and we can just zip it around. So what I recommend that you do is go and have a look at the DBA tools copy commands and think about how you're going to do this migration. Because probably what you want to do is, just like Matt was saying about schema and then data, you probably want to do configuration 
and then databases. And you probably want to do some validation that you're not putting logins that are no longer used, you're not using agent jobs that are already used, etc. So you could copy all of your configuration from your source SQL instance to your destination SQL instance. And then you can use DBA tools to be able to migrate your databases. But you're probably going to want to do that with the backup and restore commands. Because as Matt said, you know, the business will say, I only want one minute of downtime. Great. The database is 20 terabytes in size. Awesome. It's going to be a bit tricky. A backup and then a restore of 20 terabytes is going to take a fair amount of time. So perhaps what we would do is we would take a full backup, we would restore it with recovery, sorry, with no recovery, and then take some diffs and then apply those and the logs, and then you can reduce your time of outage. So you want to do some work as to how it is that you want to do it. But if you're just looking at moving configuration from one instance to another, DBA tools is definitely the thing. Go and use your favorite search engine. Thank you. And I definitely uh, uh, agree. You should. Uh, everybody should know DBA tools. It's it's a wonderful set of tools for DBA, especially for migrations. So um, then, um, upgrading SQL Server Pre 2012 from on-premises to Azure with workload tools. Gianluca, would you please tell about that? Absolutely. So. Well, uh, despite Microsoft ideas that everyone is on latest and greatest, a lot of customers are still using uh, very old uh, versions of SQL Server. And the, the ones that I find uh, very often at my clients are 2008 R2. Most of them are 2008 R2. But <laughs> still we have... Uh, lots of 2008 and even 2005, well, uh, even some very brave people are still running 2000, but those are really, um, well, I wouldn't say brave, maybe crazy these days, <laughs> uh, but there's still hope they can have moved to a newer version of SQL Server. And the reason why they haven't done so yet, uh, in many cases has to do with uh, fear that things stop working in the process. So they keep the old devil that they know and uh, they keep it running as much as possible, as long as possible. Uh, but sometimes you really need to do the shift and move to the new version. And one of the tools that can help you in the process is workload tools. Uh, we've mentioned this already in a couple of um, episodes of this webinar, and it's a set of tools that you can find on GitHub, so it's open source stuff that you can download and use. And the way workload tools can help you is uh, it can help you capture your workload and replay it in the target environment. Uh, so that you can be sure that things continue working in the target environment and also that performance doesn't uh, suck. So you want to make sure that performance is good in the target environment. Uh, well, first of all, you, you need to understand what is your car, um, correct uh, target for that. So moving from uh, an old on-prem version to uh, an Azure flavor of SQL Server can be really challenging because Microsoft doesn't really give you tools for that. Uh, you have tools to work with the newer version, but you really don't have tools for uh, the older ones. And you also need to understand which flavor of Azure you want to use for this. Um, using SQL database or managed instance might not be uh, the correct choice for older applications like this. You probably want to move to a VM. Uh, so instead of using platform as a service, you may want to use uh, infrastructure as a service in this case, and maybe move to a newer version of SQL Server like 2019, for instance. 
So you have tools for testing compatibility. Um, Matt has mentioned a couple of those already, like the Data Migration Assistant. This is a great tool for uh, assessing compatibility um, with uh, newer versions of uh, SQL Server. But once you have done that, uh, the other concern that has to do with performance can be uh, tested with the use of workload tools. So in this case, what you uh, want to do is capture a workload in the source environment and replay, uh, replay this workload uh, against uh, your target environment, which could be a VM, which could be a SQL database or a managed instance. For workload tools, it doesn't really change much. It can work with any of these um, targets. Once you have your uh, replay uh, performed, you can compare performance between the source workload and the target workload and see whether the amount of resources you chose for your um, target environment is enough. But not only that, you can capture regressions in the query plans that can very easily happen when you're changing so much uh, your uh, version. So um, workload tools can uh, help you identify queries that were running absolutely fine in your older version of SQL Server, but stop uh, working fine in your target uh, version. And you have tools for that in workload tools. You can use uh, the workload viewer uh, to uh, visualize uh, the data that you capture against the source workload and the target uh, or workload replay. And you can compare the two, um, identify the regressions and fix them right away. One of the things that is really complicated at this stage is making sure that you capture the whole uh, business cycle uh, during your, um, your capture. So uh, workload tools can help you with that. Uh, instead of capturing and saving your workload capture to a file, you can use a real-time replay um, feature to replay all your workload uh, against the target environment as soon as it happens uh, in the source. So you can have a real-time comparison between source and target and see whether you're headed for uh, some um, uh, regressions and the plans and things like that. And uh, you can keep this running for a longer period of time compared to saving uh, to a capture file. You can even have this up and running for uh, weeks or months before you make uh, a decision or you adjust performance uh, as you go before you reach the time of the uh, migration itself. So uh, instead of helping you uh, with the migration implementation, uh, moving the database around, um, uh, copying logins and stuff like that, which DBA tools is great for, uh, workload tools can help you with the performance and compatibility assessment uh, phase, which is uh, critical for migrations like this. Thank you, John Loka. So uh, the ne next topic is uh, consolidating databases from different servers by harmonizing the workloads. And uh, this scenario, how it would be possible. For example, if you have a, um, lots of SQL servers and instances and some of the servers are overutilized, some of them are underutilized, some of them are quite hard to predict how the performance is, is uh, ongoing on those on those servers and also this scenario needs a possibility to be able to move databases from their existing instances and mix them together so there are some constraints of course sql governor can be can do also resizing of servers consolidation of servers consolidation of instances and so forth but also the consolidation of databases it really needs basically these two things at least to uh, occur here and it's quite a nice way to uh, really uh, carve off all the uh, unnecessary capacity that is bound to these uh, uh, parallelly 
competing uh, databases uh, from the same resources. So first of all, when you're doing this and you want to um, harmonize these workloads and, and you want to understand how the databases behave, you need to have certain relevant performance counters. So it's of course not enough to have a server level CPU utilization, max and average components, their time series, their trends, their behavior patterns over a longer term of time, but you would also need to know RAM utilization on server level and, and also uh, what else uh, you would like to know what is happening on, on disk side, so all the things like uh, uh, IOPS, latencies, throughput, the, and, and on, on server instance and database level, so also the um, size of the databases and data files and, and, and how they are growing over time and, and log files. So um, on instance level, you would need also the CPU utilization and, and the RAM usage. But now uh, when what, what comes interesting into, uh, in the display of uh, database consolidation, you also need to know what is the amount of uh, CPU uh, processing power that each database are taking from the instance. And not only that, but also buffer cache and plan cache amount of, of the database that is basically constituting the pretty much the, uh, the workload of, of the database in terms of memory utilization. So you need to be able to query also this kind of information. It's not exactly 100% precise, but it's, it's, it's close to that. And with that uh, information, when you have it in, on long term, you're actually able to deduct that what kind of behavior each database are ha having, it's, is having, and, and you're able to uh, redistribute those databases on the new server or new servers, depending on your uh, consolidation strategy. And basically, there are two different kinds of consolidation strategies you can pick. One is so-called harmonized distribution, which means basically that you take one SQL Server instance into a new target server, and then you just seek the minimum number of servers for that so-called template that the workloads are evenly distributed in terms of uh, CPU, RAM, and disk usage. And this is... Uh, um, very good uh, place to use machine learning as, as, for example, the SQL governor software uses uh, um, internationally patented machine learning mechanism to do this kind of consolidation. So um, that's one way to do that. And the whole point there is that instead of uh, trying to uh, put um, uh, databases together that take at the same time big, big amount of resources, we play Tetris with machine learning. It's like bin packing algorithm and we find them out like this. They are perfect maps, but devil is in details. Uh, one another way, and you can mix harmonized distribution strategy with categorization strategy, and also you can uh, do it just alone, is, is where you take a one SQL server, and then you can put one to many SQL instances on that server, and you isolate different workload profiles per instance. And these can be like a constant consumers, which means that all those nasty databases that are taking all the time uh, uh, the most of the resources on, on your system. So maybe you want to isolate them into its own uh, bad behaving instance. Then rapidly growing workloads. So those workloads that seem to be okay, but when you look over many months, you can see how, how the workloads are uh, uh, getting higher and higher. And especially if you see this kind of behavior with the um, CPU, and typically if that is two number, two digit number over one year, you most probably find out something to optimize in your instance configurations, database options, indexing, uh, TSQL queries or so. But it can also be that if the system is, is very fast, rapidly growing, it can happen. So it may be a good idea to put the rapidly growing workloads into their own isolated instance. Then the volatile workloads. This is also important. These are the workloads that are hard to uh, predict and they are going up and down a lot in, in terms of um, uh, resource usage. And, and they are kind of like a constant consumers 
but they are harder to predict. They are kind of like uh, maybe the hardest part in, in, in capacity planning. And then uh, the last one is so-called ordinary workloads that are behaving correctly and they are easy to, um, they have seasonality, they have uh, certain typically linear trends, if not at all, and they are easy to predict what comes to a resource utilization. So that's how you are able to do the uh, capacity planning and, and um, um, basically the consolidation of, of uh, databases in, in a way that you are saving concrete, concrete uh, money in terms of licensing and also you may be saving lots of uh, computational power on your servers, so it is CPUs. All right, uh, and then the next topic. Um, Matt, uh, would you like to tell us the, all the lessons learned, not maybe the all, but some of them. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, yeah, we probably don't you have, have time for all of them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, if you tell some some highlights of of, of your findings of, from the uh, migrations. Yeah so, yeah. so these are kind of the four highlights, uh, and I know you know we've gone over these in some previous parts of this series. Number one is make sure you're evaluating the entire estate that you're going to migrate and do that as early as possible. Um, I can think of like larger, pro you know, it's maybe not so significant if you're like, well, we're just going to migrate all the databases on this single server up, up to Azure. Um, but I can think of larger corporate projects that I've been on where, you know, the, the scope of our migration wasn't identified up front and it, it provided real challenges as we went along. Uh, because you know this is a complicated process like multiple teams are involved um, not just on the operational side because you need network people operations people data people all that but you're affecting usually in a larger project multiple parts of the business as well um, the earlier you know all that it, it's worth pushing for that up front because it gets very difficult as a project moves along to kind of shoehorn additional work in it just it it it's just very hard and sometimes just doesn't work and you're not going to achieve everything you want to do that so it's worth it's worth putting up a bit of a stink up front um, to to make sure that you have every single environment and server and all of that identified that you're going to move and you have the opportunity to evaluate that with DMA or something like that and not just a compatibility evaluation uh, and I'll kind of fast forward to the fourth point here, but get an understanding from the business of what these applications are and what quirks they have. Um, just because you're like, well, I have a SQL Server 2014 database here and the application server runs IIS or something like that, and we're just gonna move it. Um, not necessarily. You know, I can think of some where as, as we dug into it, migration wasn't really an option because uh, one that kind of sticks out to me was, it was it seemed like a simple migration single app server single database server two databases on on the server and it was running sql server 2017 however that server was used to support an application that communicated to mobile devices on an assembly line floor basically and there were i, I would say the the networking in play there was pretty crude and cloud migration was a significant hurdle that we couldn't overcome. It was an application that was no longer supported. It was critical to their business, but there weren't changes coming and it wasn't able to communicate back. Um, so we ended up not moving it, but unfortunately we had done basically all the work to do that. And when we got to the end and kind of got the last approval from the last person, they're like, oh wait, you actually can't move this. We tried this a year and a half ago and here, here are the reasons why this won't work. So understanding the applications in play are important, um, especially if you're going to have to migrate those servers as as well. Uh, to go back to the second bullet here, evaluating the personnel involved is important. And the reason that I've phrased this in kind of a vague way is because there's two different ways you need to do this. Number one, like I've said, you need to understand and communicate with and involve all the teams that will be important to this. It's not just data people moving data stuff. It's networking, it's operations, it's the different 
parts of the business, all of that. But the second evaluation that needs to happen here, and I, I think this goes back to something we talked about maybe on the on the first one, is it's good to know who the executive sponsors are, but understand the other champions of your project in parts of the business as well. And it may not be a direct line on the org chart from CTO or executive vice president or whatever to that person, but do whatever you can to become aware of, of kind of who makes things happen. And like I said, it may not be, they may not have a title on, on the org chart that makes it sound like they're in charge, but they may have won the respect of, of the organization. And, you know, they're, they're kind of who this goes through. Um, so evaluate who those people are as well. The people that can kind of clear organizational obstacles for you. Um, is you may have, you know, with everything we've talked about, you may have the coolest technical solution to move all this stuff. But if you're getting organizational roadblocks put in your way, you need to identify the people that are going to help you move those. And that really brings us to the third bullet here. And it's, it's where I want to leave it. Um, not just data people are involved. These aren't just data projects. And a lot of the ones I've seen go south it was exactly that. It was larger corporate environments. And, you know, they're like, well, the database team is going to move this stuff. And you instantly start asking, like, what about networking? What about operations? What about the application servers or, or other support servers to, you know, that make these apps go? Oh, we're not moving those. And we don't need to involve those other people. You're, you're the Azure experts. Just do it. And, um, you know, in anything above the smallest environment, that it's just not that simple. Um, so that's kind of something to be wary of whether, no matter which side of the fence you're on, if you're a consultant coming in, kicking a project off, if you're the person on the other side where the consultant's coming to you, or you're kicking off an internal project, do not allow yourself to be boxed into that corner. Um, that's, it's, it, it's, it's going to end in tears. It, it just will. Um, so, you know, understand all the impacts to the organization, all, all the people that are involved and all the people that can help you. Thank you, Matt. So uh, next one is uh, Rob and it's about herding cats. <laughs> <laughs> Yet again, it's herding cats. So I'm going to say this, something is going to go wrong. It's going to come at you sideways. I'll give you an example. Uh, 10 minutes before this webinar, I was needed to be deploying to production. I pressed go on my script. I went and got my drink. I had a power cut. Only a very short one, but I had a power cut. Be prepared for stuff that is going to go wrong. Luckily, my production deployment was happening via Azure DevOps, so it was remote from where I was. My Machine came back up, but my camera refused to join. So hence I have a wobbly camera because I have a second camera. I was lucky, I've got a camera there I could pick up. Things are gonna go wrong. They're gonna come at you from sideways. Some of those things are just gonna be so unexpected. Your security team in your big corporate environment will allow you to put your data into Azure or other clouds. They will allow you to create virtual machines or ADF or any of these things. And then they suddenly won't allow you to have an SMB file share. And you might not find out about that until 10 days before you're due to go live. Because who needs to check if we can have a file share? You need to check that you could have a file share. Other things are going to be assumptions that you make. You think you're in control of everything, and you'll find out that the business needs approvals, needs this, needs that, needs process that you need to get. These sort of things are going to come through. Question everything as early as possible. And lastly, ensure that you can really quickly recover. If you're migrating to a new place, you have the capability to ensure that you infrastructure creation is scripted in whatever way that works with you but also with the teams who are supporting it so 
if you can do that, it means that if everything falls apart, you can press a button, you can run a script, and you can regenerate what you have. Take this chance if you're migrating to ensure that you can do that, because I promise you it will save you. All In right, all right. Time, I shall, I shall... Okay, uh, let's go to John Luca then. Okay, so uh, from my side, the, the main lesson learned is come prepared. Uh, you cannot improvise when you're doing migrations and things will break, as Rob said, uh, so you need to test and things will need to break uh, in your test environment. They don't have to break in your production environment. So uh, test, test everything, I even the obvious things that you are sure will not break, they will break. So test everything. And it's easy, uh, well, no, not easy, but easier than it used to be to do that now because Microsoft has tools for you. Uh, there's a data migration assistant. There's also a database upgrade query tuning assistant in Management Studio. You have Query Store. There's the database experimentation assistant. So Microsoft has a lot of tools. And go have a look. Uh, they are probably good for you, so try to make good use of the tools that Microsoft gives you uh, to come prepared to the day of the migration. Also, the community has tools for you. Uh, we mentioned workload tools, uh, but there are other tools that can help you explore the query story. So uh, know your tools, even the ones that, come, that, that don't come directly from Microsoft. And in my experience, uh, what is the main uh, challenge uh, with migrations uh, as far as the application is concerned is the compatibility uh, level of the database. So migrating from uh, an older version of SQL Server uh, when you change uh, the compatibility level and you go to uh, the new cardinality estimator is one of the most challenging migrations to perform. Uh, so uh, be prepared to stay in the older uh, cardinality estimator. Keep using the legacy cardinality estimator. Uh, you have uh, trace flags or database options for that. And remember that using an older database compatibility level can make your migration easier on one hand, but can also make it a roadblock because staying in an older compatibility level uh, doesn't allow you to make use of the new features uh, of the new uh, versions of SQL Server. So uh, playing with uh, uh, legacy cardinality estimator, estimation uh, can be uh, one of the things that can help you in this regard. And another thing that is the main uh, lesson learned is that lifting and shifting an application from on-prem to the cloud almost never matches the performance that you get from an application that has been written specifically uh, for the cloud. So if you're doing a migration of an, uh, an application that uh, is what that was made for on-prem and you want to move it to any uh, kind of cloud, uh, be prepared to rewrite some parts of your application because they will not perform the way uh, they're supposed to uh, when moved to the cloud for countless reasons, latencies, uh, architecture, many, many reasons, but they, you will find some parts of your application that will have to be rewritten in order to perform decently uh, in the cloud. So be prepared to touch some code at some point. Okay, thanks, Gianluca. Uh, then some of the lessons I have learned. So uh, I have focused 
into a capacity planning basically so that's that's kind of task i do the mo mostly done maybe <laughs> like a somewhere around 50 to 100 capacity planning projects so um one thing that i have noticed is that the bigger the sql server estate the less optimized the capacity is so it's it's harder to kind of uh, maintain a, a or even you try to follow all the best practices and things like that, because in the early days and not even that many years ago, there was not really software, proper software for managing and planning the capacity of your SQL estates. And also it may have been that the, most of the monitoring tools are, are relatively expensive to uh, handle, for example, hundreds or thousands of, of SQL instances altogether. Different kind of reasons, but anyway, uh, the point is that uh, um, when when monitoring all the um, servers, instances, databases, and data files uh, over time, and also capturing different kind of uh, uh, plan case data and things like that, and all of a sudden, when you have uh, months and years of data, you learn to know what kind of behavioral patterns occur in, in, in there. And especially when you have a software, for example, like a SQL governor, which is able to identify those patterns and, and plan based on that, it helps a lot and you get good savings on, on, on uh, your SQL estate when consolidating, when right sizing and, and things like that. And what I have learned also that average savings potential is over 40% in uh, uh, environments bigger than 10 servers and also what i have learned is that uh, it really that the machine learning based consolidation really compacts the production environment so instead of for example having a uh, uh, hundred smaller servers you need just uh, like a uh, 20 bigger servers and and still the servers are performing with uh, 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 same level of performance and availability. And then um, VMs are rarely optimal in sizing. This is also what I have found out. So when I have done the analysis of, of the virtual machines, it's, they are either overutilized or underutilized, but rarely they are on par, on, on kind of on relevant baselines. So this is something that I would encourage you to do, whichever the software is, uh, and 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 um, so so um, uh, you should check out that if 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 your existing VMs are running with optimal optimal workloads there, or if you need to uh, uh, adjust them. Uh, then uh, what else? Um, physical servers often have some underutilization in CPU. Maybe because they have their life cycle, they want they, uh, many times you need to plan some extra buffer there because you don't want uh, uh, the server hardware to get old uh, during the first year or two. You may want to run it for three years or five years or so, depending on, on vari variables on, on, on that. But that is something that I have noticed. And, and, and the more you have the data in, in the monitoring side, and, and the better you have, the better grip you have on understanding that you need, for example, 64 or 128 cores for that, that workload to handle. And that's a, quite the difference if you have enterprise SQL Server with SA. So it's quite a <laughs> uh, big money there uh, to be saved. And then one thing that I have also noticed many times that the CPU contention is common and very insidious dangerous problem in, in production environments. What it means, it basically means that um, if a, a CPU on a server level is um, performing on 80% level or higher, continuously at least five minutes, and during that five minutes uh, time, uh, also the processor Q is two, two times or more the logical core number. So the processor Q is basically starting to uh, uh, it's kind of like uh, uh, it's it's growing there, and and you're not able to process all that data, so it slows down the system actually. Excuse me, I have a little alert here. So, okay. So um, 
then uh, CPU contention is, is, is not that trivial to find out because you need to kind of size and dice each five minute interval for each hour aggregated and, and seek if there is any of them. And you need to also uh, find out the SLAs for them. So how many times over time this occurs and what is the, for example, in failover system, uh, what is, um, uh, or AGs, what is the uh, kind of proportional amount of, uh, what is the SLA on a um, scenario where you, your system failovers? So you need to also understand that and calculate those things. So those are, for example, things that it's easy to do with, with, with SQL governor software. So uh, that is one thing that I think is very important what comes to a, a static performance of, of, of SQL servers. And then the last thing, um, that's um, something I want to say just with a couple of words that the Azure Past Managed Instances general, general purpose is basically a, there are certain concrete performance constraints and I wouldn't really use it for production only in certain special cases because then, for example, the IOPS settings and, and where you need to configure the data files it does not give the uh, a kind of, um, how would I say, um, stable performance and there can be issues like uh, uh, um, checkpointing and things like that that may kind of a peak and, and uh, uh, kind of put the CPU up and down there and, and things like that. So, so definitely uh, would consider using a business critical storage uh, tier to, uh, uh, to uh, that, that area. So those are things I wanted to mention and I'm aware of sense of time here. We have a couple of questions. So please, John, Luca, Matt and Rob, uh, answer these questions if you will i read them here out loud so um let me see so the first one I okay see, what is the most challenging most challenges you experience when migrating to azure from john and yeah for me What's to answer? that is particularly around the things that other areas of the corporation infrastructure team are in control of so you deploy something and an Azure policy sits over the top and takes it away, or uh, you can't get DNS registered or the networking things. Not the data part of it so much as what is happening by other controls. The second part that's really challenging is that supporting this infrastructure is hard for people. People will generally want to go back to the portal. And when we're dealing with a lot of instances, we really should be using some sort of automation for that. So those are the two things I've found most challenging with migrating into um, Azure, as well as managed instance won't let me run SQL agent jobs with DBA tools as a PowerShell step. But apart from yeah, that. I Yes. I would yeah. echo sure. those and, and also say that team buy-in, I mean, almost any technical challenge can be solved if you've got the right people in, involved. Team buy-in is very difficult. And I can think of a couple projects, one I was involved in, one I came in afterwards, where it went off the rails and ultimately failed because the team was obstinate and basically refused to kind of modernize their skill set. They didn't want to. They had worked there a long time and just made the decision that they wouldn't. And their manager, you know, just kind of let them do what they chose and they chose poorly. <laughs> um, you know, and it's not probably good for their career, but certainly for the company, it was pretty bad. Um, the mm -hmm. company lost out opportunities to save, you know, several hundred thousand dollars because basically a handful of people didn't want to row the boat the same way. Okay. Um, then one thing also about the managed instances, I forgot to actually say, but they're in, in, the, in the general general purpose. If you have lots of databases, especially small databases in one instance, and there is still certain level of perform performance you need to have in them, even they are not the most super critical ones. It may be that when you put them all in the same managed instance and try to do that with general purpose, you find out that you need the, this much storage, a lot of storage space because of the way how you need to allocate that to guarantee a certain level of IOPS and so forth. Gianluca, do you have anything to comment on this question? 
Oh, well, as I said, the most challenging things uh, from the technical side have to do with the application and the way it is written. So, um, one of the things that I find really challenging in these kind of migrations is guaranteeing the same level of performance that you get from the source environment. And that's why you need to come prepared. Yes. And then there is time for one question still. And uh, let me see if there is any. I don't think there is no other questions. So uh, it's time to um, uh, say the <laughs> la last words in this series of webinar, a bit dramatic <laughs> speech here, but uh, you can follow Matt on Twitter with uh, at SQL at speed, John Lucas Paketti DBA, Rob SQL DBA with the bird, and then myself as a Cyber Sigma. And uh, thank you so much. And I would encourage you to get known to all these uh, freeware tools like uh, workload tools, DBA tools, Microsoft tools like DMA, DMS, so forth. And also, of course, the SQL governor software for, for capacity planning and performance automation of SQL estates. Thank you very much. Thank you, John Luca. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Rob. And over and out. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.